my job is only to welcome you and introduce Dr. Graham Worthy, who's a Pegasus professor at UCF. That's our highest accomplishment, the highest honor for faculty. He's a chaired faculty member and he's chair of the Department of Biology, and he's going to introduce tonight's speaker. Great. Thank you. I could ad lib, but I probably should stick with the notes. I know Will a little bit dangerously well. But it is my honor tonight to introduce the guest speaker, Dr. Will Crampton, who has been with the Department of Biology since 2006, I believe, is an associate professor in that department. His research focuses on ecological, behavioral, and evolutionary mechanisms that generate and regulate species diversity in the gymnotiform electric knife fishes of South and Central America, which is quite a mouthful. And I think you'll appreciate by the end of today the complexity of this system and the approach he's taken to really understand these fish at all levels. He's described over 50 new species of electric fish, and he's focused on the discovery and the description of biodiversity in a system which is quite heavily impacted. His research has been showcased in BBC, National Geographic, and Discovery Channel documentaries. And during his sabbatical leave this past year, he served as the scientific director and field producer of the Smithsonian Channel documentary, The Electric Amazon, which is what we'll be talking about tonight. So he's going to convey, I think, his passion for this, the enthusiasm for this, and the deep understanding that he's bringing to these fish. And hopefully you'll get some feeling of that excitement. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Well, thank you, Dr. Worthy, and thank you, uh, Dean Johnson. Thank you not only for the opportunity to speak tonight, but thank you also for, for providing a wonderfully supportive and uh, stimulating working environment at UCF. It's my greatest pleasure uh, to be a scientist at the University of Central Florida. The tropical rainforests of the world, which wrap around the equator like an emerald belt, cover just 2% of the surface of the planet, and yet they contain more than half of all planetary species diversity. The largest of all of the tropical rainforests is Amazonia. It covers some 2.7 um, million square miles, which is an area similar to the lower 48 states of the USA, and similar to the entire continent of Australia. And from trees to birds, from mammals to insects, the Amazon is unquestionably the home to more diversity of species than anywhere in the world. In terms of species diversity, one of the most impressive groups of Amazonian organisms are the fish. There are probably something like 3,000 species of them. Now, the waters of the Amazon make up just 0.045% of the volume of all of the freshwater lakes and rivers on the planet, and a trifling 0.000005% of the volume of all liquid water in the world's seas and freshwaters. And yet, no fewer than one in 10 of all fishes is an Amazonian fish, and this proportion may in fact turn out to be even higher. Now I've dedicated the last 25 years of my career to understanding how this diversity originated and how it, and how it is maintained. Much of my work has focused on one group of Amazonian fish, the electric fish. What, made, what motivated me from the onset to study these fish, and what still motivates me, is a very simple question. Why are, there so, why are there so many species? So the question of why there are so many species in tropical rainforests is one of the biggest questions in biology. And also, simply quantifying how many species there are in the tropics is a task we are far from completing. We have, in fact, a very poor idea of how many species there are in tropical forests, as indeed we do for the world as a whole. Although scientists, scientists have so far described around 1.3 million species, um, about half of them from tropical forests, the true number of species on the planet, based on extrapolations um, from current description rates, 
is probably something closer to 10 million. Now, the astrophysicist Brian Cox speculated that if a friendly race of aliens were to visit us here on Earth, one of the first questions they might ask might be, well, how many species of organisms do you share your planet with? And to our embarrassment, we wouldn't be able to answer that question, but we don't know yet, um, even to within an order of magnitude, what that number actually is. Now, when I was first invited to give this lecture, I, th I thought immediately of the title Electric Amazon, for it conveys a double meaning. First, my research on the electric uh, knife fishes and eels of the Amazon and uh, the New World Tropics. And second, because as Dr. Worthy mentioned, um, during my sabbatical leave, I had the opportunity to co-direct a major natural history film uh, entitled The Electric Amazon. And the video clips you will see today in this talk are from that film. But the title has a third meaning, one that is a meditation on what it feels like to work in the Amazon. The place, simply put, has an extraordinary, exhilarating, yes, um, electrical feeling to it. Amazonia is part of me now. I first visited 24 years ago. It was my home in a small town in the Brazilian state of Amazonas for eight years. And it's a place I've returned to every year of my life to continue this love affair. It's a place that provides constant intellectual rejuvenation. And it's a place of incredible adventure. So let us begin. Now, there are several reasons why the neotropical electric fish are a good model system to understand tropical species diversity. In the first place, they have species-specific communication signals that help to resolve taxonomic problems and also provide a unique window onto the mechanisms of reproductive isolation among species and the very mechanisms of species formation. Also, typical of tropical animals, they also form species-rich communities. Much of my earlier work, including my doctoral field work, was conducted close to the town of Tefe uh, in the Brazilian Amazon. When I began my fieldwork in 1992, um, only 96 electric fish species were known um, from all of South and Central America. And yet within seven years, I found 92 species within just 30 miles of this town. Over 70% over of these species were new to science, and I'm still working today on describing this diversity. Another huge advantage of working with electric fish is that their signals can be detected with submerged electrodes. They can be amplified and converted to sound uh, and broadcast with portable fish finders. This is electrical engineer Jeff Lambert, who's with us here tonight, um, in a stream in Peru using one of the portable electric fish finders that he designed. And this is the kind of thing you might hear. And that goes on and on. Um, unlike frogs or birds, uh, these signals are produced constantly, allowing us to find these uh, fish and to eavesdrop on their strange world of um, electrical communication signals with incredible ease. In fact, these signals begin soon after electric fish hatch and continue right the way through their lives. One can even send electrodes on cables down into the depths of the Amazon down into a dark and alien world, alive with electricity. So let me start with a brief primer on electric fish biology and their unique electrogenic and electrosensory systems. The neotropical electric fish have a single electric organ uh, located in the tail and the ventral part of their body. And this comprises electric cells, each of which is innervated by a spinal um, um, column nerve. And when innervated, sodium ions rush through pores in the cell membranes, creating a small electric potential. Now, all of the electric cells are wired up in synchrony. And their currents, some in parallel, and their voltages, some in series. 
When it fires, the electric organ discharge depolarizes the skin of the fish and sets up a, di a dipole-like electrostatic field in the water. Now, the electric fish also have tiny electroreceptor organs uh, embedded in their skin, which can detect changes in transdermal voltages. Nearby objects in the water change the electric fish field geometry, and the electric fish's electroreceptors are able to detect these distortions, allowing them to locate objects in the dark. Indeed, all electric fish are nocturnal, and we call this electrolocation. Now, these same electroreceptors are also able to detect the electric signals emanating from nearby fish, permitting communication by electric signaling. Now, it's because these electric communication signals also serve for object location that they're generated constantly. Now, most neotropical electric fish are called knife fish due to their knife-like shape and they generate weak electric signals, typically not exceeding about one volt. So these are too weak for us to feel. And there are five families of knife fish. Three of these families generate pulsed type signals comprising pulses of electricity uh, with intervening periods of silence of variable, du variable duration. First, the gymnotidae, and here's an example. The ramphic theodae, and here's an example species. And the hyperpomidae. Two families of knife fish generate constant sinusoidal discharges um, with no periods of silence. First, the sternopygidae, and here's an example. And next, the high frequency apronotidae. grimace to listen to that. And even within these families, there's tremendous species-related variation in the rate of these discharges and the shape of the individual waveforms. But remember, these are not sounds. They are sound translations of electric fields. Now, most knife fish are only a few inches long. Some are miniaturized and mature at less than a couple of inches in length. All are nocturnal, and most eat small invertebrates. Others get larger, um, even to about a meter long. Some of these are fish predators. However, there's an exception to the low voltages of neotropical electric fishes. Within the family Gymnotidae, there are two genera. One is Gymnotus, the banded knife fish. These have typical low voltage pulsed signals. And the other is Electrophorus, the electric eel. Now, the electric eel is, in fact, not an eel. It's a giant knife fish, and it has a giant, highly specialized electric organ, which is capable of producing two kinds of discharges. First, relatively low voltage pulses of around 10 volts that it uses to detect, to detect objects in the dark and also to communicate, like other electric fish. And also high voltage pulses, which in adults can reach 1,000 volts. And these are, are used for hunting and for defense. So this is an electric eel. I'm going to play the sound back. What you're going to hear is a series of the low voltage pulses and then a, high, and then a volley of high voltage pulses as it shocks uh, its prey. I'm now, I'm now going to show a video of an electric eel hunting a small weekly electric knife fish. Uh, we filmed this um, in complete darkness using infrared film. Cloaked in darkness, the electric eel moves in on its prey. It sends out a high voltage shock that stuns the fish. So when I said that um, electric eels are giant knife fish, I meant it. Uh, this is a 1.8 meter specimen from Suriname. It weighed about 40 pounds. I've seen ones that are larger, up to about 2.4 meters long. That, that's um, eight feet long. And Amazonian fishermen report them uh, to up to three meters long, and, and I believe them. Now, a large part of my research involves describing species diversity. 
it's essentially the first step in understanding biodiversity. To describe new species usually involves expeditions to remote or poorly sampled areas, but it also involves visiting natural history collections, uh, which hold collections going back to the 1800s. Natural history museums are essentially libraries of biodiversity. And just like one can borrow a book from a library, you can also borrow specimens, and I'll send them to you by FedEx. Now, field expeditions and the study of museum collections also allows us to build up a picture of the geographical distributions of species. Here, for example, is the geographical range for all known specimens of the genus Brachyhypopomus, a genus that my lab is now very interested in. Another major goal of my research is to describe how species are interrelated, building what we call phylogenetic trees, which are essentially genealogical trees of species. Now, these are built by searching for homology, characters that are shared due to common ancestry, in both morpho morphological traits and also in the genome. So for Brachyhypopomus, we built trees from characters gleaned from morphology, mostly from skeletal anatomy. Here we've cleared and stained specimens. The, the red is bone and the blue is cartilage. Or from molecular data, using the sequence of nucleotide bases in the DNA of electric fish cells, not just in the nucleus, but also in the mitochondria. And another major goal of my research is to describe the diversity of electric signals. And we do this by placing a fish between electrodes, usually in a cooler in the field. We amplify the signals. And then we digitize them onto a computer as a series of voltages at known um, time samples. And this we use to construct a two-dimensional time voltage waveform of the signal. It's in meadows like these that Will has found many of his new discoveries. Some of the electric waveforms are so distinct, he could tell if it's something new just by listening. The meadow is packed full of electric fish. Will catches as many different types as he can. With so many different variations, the only definitive way to tell if he has a new species is to record their electric waveforms. Storm's really messed up the camp. Will turns a cooler into a mini aquarium to record the electric fish signals. What he finds is surprising. One of the waveforms is unlike anything he has ever seen. And this species, which I think is undescribed, I've never seen it before, has a very distinctive waveform with four phases. It's shorter, so it sounds like it's a higher frequency. It's an exciting discovery and could be a valuable addition to his research. If this is a new species, Will can formally name it and add it to his list, along with the 50 others that he's described. Thank you, Julia Anderson, for, for very adeptly editing that little montage from the, from the film. I now want to explore two of the reasons why electric fish may be so diverse. And the first is related to the myriad ecological specializations that adapt them to varied local conditions, including food sources and water chemistry. These ecological adaptations, in large part, explain how so many species of electric fish are packed into local communities. And here I'm going to give a few examples of adaptations in electric fish from the three main aquatic habitats of the lowland Amazon. The deep river channels, the floodplains, and um, streams of, uh, running through rainforests. Electric fish are by far the most numerous uh, of fishes in this habitat. And to do this, we use marine um, trawling equipment. These are shrimp trawls. Uh, the exact same kind that Forrest Gump used in the film when he went tr um, shrimp trawling with Bubba. 
This is difficult and quite dangerous work and expensive because the nets often become snagged in underwater trees. Now one of the great mysteries um, of electric fish was how they survived in very swiftly flowing rivers like the Amazon, which can flow at up to two meters per second, when in fact they're not very strong swimmers. Um, however, we found the answer to this. Um, these black and white images are sonar traces of the Amazon. This is going across the Amazon, in fact, a, a small side branch of the Amazon, about 500 meters across, and you can see that it reaches a maximum depth of about 35 meters. And in fact, that's, um, that's a normal depth for the Amazon. It's, it commonly reaches twice that depth, as far as 3,000 miles from the sea. So 35 meters is about 100 feet deep. But the interesting thing is if you look, on this, uh, look at this sonar going down the Amazon as we go downstream, and what you see is that far from being a, a homogenous landscape of mud, the bottom of the Amazon is highly contoured. It's folded into a series of uh, ridges mud ridges that are quite high, some of them up to about 10 meters high, which is as far as we are from the street. Uh, and this final image here is a side scan image of the bottom of the Amazon. This is probably one of the very first times this has ever been done. Um, what you're seeing there is literally a scan of the bottom of the Amazon. You can see these parallel ridges and troughs. And the electric fish live in those troughs and move around in them. They, they cross the river like highways. And it's in these environments that soft mud deposits out in the weak currents uh, and, those, and that mud is full of invertebrates which they eat. So this is an amazing thing to be able to see the bottom of the Amazon because when you look at Amazonian water it's so cloudy that you can only actually see through it um, by a few inches, if that. Now the fact that the Amazon is so muddy um, means that below about three meters in depth, there's essentially no light whatsoever. Even during uh, the midday tropical sun with its burning incandescence, uh, there is no light. Electric fish live in a permanently dark world at the bottom of these rivers. Now, many species of, that live in these habitats have lost their skin pigmentation uh, and are ghostly white. In fact, the a uh, common word for electric fish in Brazil, sarapo, derives from the Tupi word for ghost. Now, not only that, but because vision is useless in these environments and they rely on their electric sense, their eyes are highly reduced, in this case just to pinpricks, and they're vestigial, they're not used. In fact, it is common to find uh, the eye missing or covered with thick skin on one or both sides of electric fish from these habitats. This reduction of skin pigmentation and loss of vision uh, has parallels in fish that live in another permanently dark world, that of deep limestone caverns. Mud and submerged wood at the bottom of the Amazon is riddled with burrows uh, of insect larvae, um, even deep at the bottom. And many of the deep river electric fish have tube snouts, uh, that have evolved to be able to pick insects out of these burrows. Now, some of them suck insects out, and some put their noses in and, and take them out um, with a pincer-like motion. Um, but it turns out that each species at the bottom of the Amazon is adapted to feed on certain kinds of insects. But perhaps the most extraordinary feeding adaptation found in any electric fish is found in a species called Magostonarchus raptor. This species based on stomach contents, were suspected to feed only on the tails of other electric fish, um, which it bites off with sharp teeth, uh, a behavior it accomplishes in complete darkness using only its electric sense. Um, and amazingly, uh, the electric fish that it bites then regenerate their tail tails, so it's a kind of sustainable resource. Um, but this behavior had never been seen before, uh, but we did manage to film it. We spent a lot of time trying to do this, um, and here it is. It's the, actual the actual action of it biting off is just, unfortunately, slightly out of frame. There are even electric fish that have adapted to feed on the tails of other electric fish. Strange as these creatures might seem to the naked eye, their world is even stranger. Now, the second major habitat for electric fish is the Amazon floodplain. These are vast areas 
of seasonally flooded rainforests and lakes fringed by floating grasses and water hyacinths and other plants. And during the high water period, the decomposition of leaf litter and other organic debris on the forest floor strips away the oxygen from the water column until the waters of the floodplain become deeply anoxic. And only the fish that are capable of breathing air are able to persist in these environments. So some species, like Brachyhypopomus, rise to the surface and fill their gill chambers with air bubbles and extract oxygen from the bubbles. The electric eel also breathes air, but is much better at it. The eel gets 80% of its oxygen by breathing air. Now the eel's secret for air breathing is that the lining of its mouth is its lung. It's highly folded and highly vascularized to extract oxygen from each gulp of air. Now another major challenge of life in floodplains uh, is the very high level of predation, including, not least, from high densities of flesh-eating piranhas. And the electric fish have an extraordinary adaptation to predation. They can regenerate their bodies. Now this fish has had over two-thirds of its body bitten off, it's grown some of it back, and in time it'll grow the rest of it back. It will grow bone and scales and fin and electric organ and even spinal cord tissue, which has the medical industry interested in electric fish uh, regeneration for its potential role in therapy for spinal injuries. And the final habitat in which electric fish abound are small rainforest streams. Here, many of the electric fish are miniaturized, their diminutive size allowing them to forage among uh, the interstices of uh, submerged leaf litter and roots. One of my favorites is Gymnoramphictus rondoni, which hides from predators in sand during the day and comes out at night. And we film this. Sand burrowing glass knife fish rise from the depths. So another reason why electric fish are so diverse may be related to divergences in their electric signals. And currently, we're merging data from phylogeny, geographical distributions, and signal diversity in the genus Brachyhypopomus to explore such um, patterns. Here we assemble distributional notes from over 12,000 individual specimens um, to work out the uh, geographical ranges um, of the species in the genus, and we also recorded electric signals from 27 of the 28 species in the genus, uh, 15 of which we had to describe as new species uh, in the process of doing this work. These are the electric signals for all of the species in this genus, um, plotted underneath a phylogenetic tree um, for the group. As you can see, there's considerable diversity of their waveforms. Many of the waveforms are bifa biphasic, and they vary in duration. Now, there are a couple that are triphasic. These ones are tetraphasic. And there's one species that has a monophasic discharge. But the interesting thing is to compare the signals of sister species. And what we noted is that sister species that do not co-occur geographically, those in green boxes, invariably have the same number of phases in their discharge. For example, 2-2, 2-2, 4-4, 2-2. In contrast, species uh, that do co-occur co uh, in geographical sympatry, in every single case, show a divergence in the number of phases in their waveform. Here, one has two and the other has one. Uh, here we have a uh, two and a four, and here we have a two and a four. So it's apparent that there's been a divergence in their signal um, structure concomitant with the process of speciation. Um, and we suspect that this is part of a process to reduce errors in mating. For um, 
crosses between different species um, usually have costly consequences in terms of the low fitness or fertility of hybrids. And this is exciting because it is rare in nature to find evidence for divergences of this kind in communication signal structure uh, with this kind of clear geographical and phylogenetic um, pattern. And so, so now we move on to the two short final sections of this talk. First to the film, The Electric Amazon. Now, about four years ago, I was asked by a friend who works for a South African production company called EarthTouch if I'd be interested in making a film about electric eels. Now, we'd worked together on a National Geographic television production. Uh, and he's a creative director in EarthTouch. And my reply was yes, but only if the film could also be about the weekly electric fish, which is the main subject of my research. And so we, we set about together writing uh, a pitch, which we submitted first to National Geographic. They were not interested, nor were Discovery Channel. They're too busy making films about aliens and pyramids to be interested <laughs> in us. But the Smithsonian Channel, they bit. And they ended up giving us $300,000, or a little bit more than that, in fact, to make the film. And very fortunately, I was awarded a sabbatical at UCF um, in 2015. And this gave me the four months that I needed to be in the field uh, during the different Amazonian seasons and the different reproductive periods of, of the electric fish. Now, for the first three months, it was just me and a really superb uh, cinematographer um, from California, whose name was Owen Bissell, uh, and a team of local assistants that we, uh, that we hired in the field. Now, these first three months of uh, filming were based in what can only really be described as a, a depressingly dark and moldy warehouse in the Peruvian uh, Amazonian town of Iquitos. Uh, this was, in fact, a former ornamental fish exporting company, and so they had all the tanks and, and water-producing facilities that we needed. It really was perfect for us. And so we built large filming tanks and dressed them to resemble underwater scenes, and we spent night after night trying to record behavioral scenes from electric fish and from, um, from the knife fish, often in complete darkness for hours on end using infrared video. I did the sound recordings um, using the same techniques for my research, but of course these are not sounds, um, they're electric fields, so here you see me not with a microphone but with a pair of electrodes. Um, and I chased the, electro, uh, chased the fish with electrodes to get, create different sensation, feelings of the, of, the, of the sound fading in and out um, as, as we did this. And I built up a library of electric signals that were then dubbed onto the, onto the soundtrack later and incorporated also into the, into the music, which was fun. So we worked very hard. We slept in a hotel during the day and we worked all night. We ate awful food. Uh, we drank a lot of coffee. We developed addictions to um, coca leaf tea. Uh, we told a lot of jokes. Just the two of us there for days and days on end. But it was worth it. And here is my favorite scene from the film. His call has attracted another male with the same game plan. Now he fights for breeding rights. His adversary has a thinner jaw, but he's matched in strength. The imposter has him in a lockdown. He's lost the challenge. His penalty is to change his electric frequency giving the victor free reign over the electric channel. So we then spent about a total of a month in the field, doing the field sequences of the film. We worked in the deep river channels, we worked in the floodplain, we worked in rainforest streams. Uh, this is the jungle camp that featured in that little clip. 
Uh, this is the vessel we used to get there. Not exactly a very confidence-inspiring uh, name for the bone. Um, of course, we pondered over the fate of Titanic's 2, 3, and 4. Rather amazingly, perhaps flatteringly, um, the company kind of forgot about us, the production company, left Owen and I making this film for three months, and then the very end of it, actually more like four months, the very end of it, they decided they'd actually send a professional director, uh, Kira Ivanov, and also a second cameraman, uh, who was a Christian Bale lookalike, his name was um, Grant. And um, we worked on finalizing some of the field scenes, but this was during the rainy season. It was awfully depressing. Uh, the mosquitoes were simply dreadful. Uh, the heat was terrible. It, we were rained upon. The cameras kept breaking. It was really awful. But there were some light-hearted moments. Uh, there was one um, scene where we, we needed to do a piece to camera. And a piece to camera is where essentially they sit you down and the host, which, which was me, talks to the camera. And then they... They use, um, they use the, the, either the voice uh, to lay over other scenes or they actually use parts of it uh, to, to intervene into the narrative. Um, so we were tired and we were wet and we were miserable and I was trying valiantly to explain something very complicated um, and Grant started to snigger and then, and, and then um, Kira started laughing and then they collapsed into they were almost rolling around in the mud laughing and I didn't know what was going on and it turned out that we were making this film and we unwittingly set up the scene uh, in front of a palm tree which had these nascent prop shoots coming out of the trunk which it has to be said look extremely phallic and <laughs> in fact there wasn't just one of these things there was a whole cluster of them right behind my head and what set them off laughing was that one of them started to drip some kind of slime off the tip of it <laughs> behind my head as I did this. So um, unfortunately, I didn't, uh, I didn't take a picture of the scene, but I did take a picture of the prop route, so you can decide for yourself whether... Um, and um, <laughs> there they are. The, uh, the, the, the slime dripping had actually stopped at this point. Um, actually, Earth Touch is now putting together an international version of this film, and I, I wake up at night with... Um, with nightmares that, um, that, that they might actually use this scene. Um, you know, this is the kind of thing that would, that would go viral. And uh, I don't know if Dean Johnson would be particularly pleased to see the name of the College of Science associated with this kind of image. Um, but anyway, to add a, 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 some decorum to this, uh, this is actually a very interesting species. It's a palm of the, the genus Iralea. So I just want to finalize this talk with a few reflections on what it's like to work in the Amazon. So over the years, I've lived in floating research stations, in field camps, and a lot on boats. And it's a place of giant skies and incredible natural beauty. It's been an enchanting career, but the greatest pleasure of all is working with the people of the Amazon. They're wonderfully industrious and flexible and good-natured people. And they're people who really love to fish, and they really like fish. So it's very easy to work with them. They love fishing. In fact, fishing in the Amazon is often a spectator sport. Um, although I think in this case, these children were more fascinated by my outlandish hat than they were with... Um, the electric fish. So some of these people I've known for years. This is Jonas. Uh, he was my technician, technician uh, and field assistant during my doctoral field work. This is a picture taken way back in 1994. And together we learned fish diversity. And he mentored me in the ways of the forest and, and in fishing. Now Jonas is brought up in a tiny village in the interior, deep in the forest. And he didn't hold a high school diploma, as was normal in that region at that time. And Jonas has been a lifelong friend and also a collaborator. This is a picture of him uh, taken last November uh, on the Rio Tapajós during an expedition from a National Science Foundation grant that I'm directing to look at aquatic biodiversity in the lower Amazon. And um, in fact, Jonas has 
uh, flourished um, after I left Hefe. He went on to complete his high school diploma. And he's, in fact, now a very well-known parataxonomist. He's highly respected by many Brazilian ichthyologists and many outside Brazil. And he often flies around South America um, helping with biodiversity inventory projects. Now, my very first species description was uh, in honor of Jonas. I named this species Gymnotus jonasi. And because of this paper, everybody in Brazil actually just calls Jonas Gymnotus. In fact, I don't think any of the ichthyologists who work with him actually know his real name. He's <laughs> Gymnotus. Now, back in the years of my doctorate, I spent a lot of time living with Amazonian locals in remote villages, often on the edges of really trackless, wild forests. These are places where they'd set fires at night in the village to ward off jaguars and pumas, something like the fairy tale um, forests of medieval Europe. These are places that really are on the edge of the world. And the way of life of these people is very similar to the Amerindians from which they descend, often by only two or three generations, and which they are often very proud to identify with. There's an incredible unity with nature. All of the children keep pets of forest animals, for example. And they even make toys from the forest. Um, there's a leaf which, uh, when broken, um, for example, uh, makes a soap bubble ring. And all of the children in the Amazon know how to do this. They play with things from the forest. So most of these people are only two or three generations from the Amerindians, of which, amazingly, there are still some uncon uncontacted groups living in the wilds of the forest. And there's always a sense in the Amazon that one treads in the shadow of Indians from the past. Now, back in the late 1990s, um, Jonas and, and, and a group of uh, fishermen that I was working with and I were invited to a party in a tiny village in a very remote lake called Lago Amana. Um, so we went over from our boat and, um, of course, we drank lots of cachaça, which is Brazilian cane rum. And um, late in the night, I stumbled out into the nearby forest looking for a place to pee. And um, I came across, I never took a picture of it, but it was something like this. I came across a field of half-interred ancient funeral urns. This is very ancient pre-Columbian ceramic. Uh, it was all eerily illuminated by the party nights from the village. And in fact, ceramic pot shards and clay figurines are, uh, of the ancient Indians are very common along the banks of the rivers of the Amazon, and we commonly dredge them up in our nets. These ceramics, which are from Tefe, actually derive from several civilizations, some that were around at the time of European contact, and others that are likely as old as 3,000 years ago. And in November last year, we visited a magical place in the lower Amazon called Pedra Pintada. It's an outcrop in the wild Cerro do Erere uh, mountain range, where the rocks are covered by strange paintings and handprints. Now, these, this is a very famous archaeological site, and these are 11,000 years old. In fact, this is the oldest art known from the Western Hemisphere, including anywhere in North America. So these Paleolithic people must have arrived in South America not long after the Clovis people uh, of North America, such as the antiquity of human civilization in the Amazon. On this trip, back in November, we went further north from the Serra do Erere into the wild forests of the agricultural frontier along new roads carved into virgin forest. And here we found pristine forests swarming with life and cool, crystal clear rivers running out of them, happily full of electric fish. And we even found a giant waterfall hidden in the forest at the end of a long road that no one goes along. Uh, a waterfall with no name on a river that even the settlers of the area didn't know, how to, didn't know its name. One of them, we asked him what it was called, and he said, oh, that's Igarapé Vincicerci, it's stream 27, and he was using a number from the government land demarcation maps. It didn't have a name. That's a giant, beautiful waterfall carved out of Ordovician sandstone, deep and, in the, and hidden in the forest. 
But sadly, on this, tra on this trip, we also came face to face with the tragedy of deforestation. In this case, deforestation for cattle ranching, um, which is preceded by burning. Now, the scale of this kind of destruction has to be seen to be believed. This isn't just horizon to horizon destruction. This is many horizons. We would drive for hours through Holocaust-like scenes where everything had been reduced to nothing but ash. Nothing. As if a nuclear explosion had evaporated everything. Land converted from the most diverse and intricate and beautiful ecosystem on the planet to nothing but cinder. So therein lies the tragedy that this precious half of all planetary diversity in these tropical forests is deeply imperiled. It is going fast and sometimes for hardly any profit. It's really a true tragedy. Now I will continue my quest to understand tropical diversity in the Amazon for the rest of my career and I hope also to make more natural history films about the place. Films that one day may sadly be our only memory of the place. So let me finish by returning to our imaginary alien visitors, were they indeed to visit us in a couple of hundred years from now, and ask that question. So how many species do you share your planet with? And the answer might well have to be, well, you know, we don't know. And we never found out, and now it's too late because it's all gone. And wouldn't that be a shameful answer that humanity would have to give? So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I have many people to thank, too numerous, in fact, to mention, but I'd happily take any questions now.